In preparation for today's message, we shall be reading from the book of John, chapter 3, verses 22 to 30. That's John, chapter 3, verses 22 to 30. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Enon near Salim, because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear, wit bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. Today's sermon is, He must increase. From John chapter 3, verses 22 to 30. After explaining God's love and justice through Christ, the writer brought the reader back to the Baptist. John continued to baptize in a place called Anon, which was in Judea. Christ's disciples were also baptizing in the area. Someone brought to John's attention John the Baptist, not the writer, that there were more following Christ than him. Instead of feeling threatened or insecure, John's response showed us God's plan to bring people to Christ. First point here is there were two groups baptizing. Let's read verses 22. 224, after this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. Not Christ, them, the disciples were baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim, because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. And as I mentioned, if you want more details on John the Baptist, feel free to study Matthew and Luke especially to understand that some of the details being mentioned. Because John's style of writing is focusing on who Christ is, and he loves to do shortcuts. He doesn't, his purpose was not to tell you all about John the Baptist, unlike in the narratives in Matthew and Luke, where there were more details. His purpose is to show who Jesus is. So, by highlighting them, how does he highlight? By removing the non-essentials to his purpose. The same way when we studied the, uh, chapter 3, the beginning of chapter 3, when Nicodemus approached Jesus Christ, it seemed like a short conversation, but traditionally, when two rabbis speak, the tradition during that time was to start at night and end at midnight. So that was a long conversation. It was a social discourse between two teachers. However, John, the writer, did not put in everything. His highlight was to show that Christ is the one who ascended and descended, and that who he is, and the mention of, of the serpent in the wilderness, and being that as a parallel to those who are in sin, who are poisoned by sin. So here as well, in parentheses, 
for John had not yet been put in prison. And we know the story that he was put in prison and he was beheaded by Herod. Now, this was the time that they were in the same area. And John first baptized to prepare the way of the coming of the Messiah. Prepare the way of the Lord. He was the voice in the wilderness. And when he did that, many people came. And it's, the accounts, is, again, is in Matthew and Luke. And we see there that all Judea, I mean, well, when the Bible says all, it doesn't always literally mean all. It's like, not always. Sometimes it is, so we have to use the context. Again, as I mentioned, like when you go to an event and there were few people, you call your friend and says, there's no one here. That's wrong because you're there. And there are a few people there, but you say, there's no one here. So when we see the word uh, all, and sometimes we have to be careful in what it means. So they were baptizing and uh, more people. There's a bigger crowd with the disciples of Jesus Christ. Um, but the disciple would say, all of them are there. Now, two groups. John the Baptist baptized at Anon and his disciples before he was sent to prison. The Lord Jesus was with his disciples in the Judean countryside. His disciples were baptizing people as well. Now, John, what we want to note here is John the Baptist continued to prepare people to meet Christ. He continued. He did not stop. When he saw the Lamb of God and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, he didn't say, I'm retired now. I've done my job. The Lamb of God is here. So I've done my purpose. I can now rest and do some R&R &R and maybe go to the Dead Sea for some, to the beach and maybe retire there. No, he did not say that. The Bible did not say that. In fact, he continued even after his job was done in introducing Christ. Now, he might think, I'm still preparing people. Not everybody has met him because his ministry was still starting then. By preaching to them about God's way, that he is coming, perhaps they will have a more open heart when they hear about or when they encounter Jesus, the Lamb of God. Now, he continued doing or baptizing, and his baptism is known as the baptism of repentance. And you can reference that in Luke chapter 3, verse 3. It was labeled the baptism of repentance because he was calling people to repent of their sins and to prepare the way of the Lord. Now, the Lord's disciples also baptized, since some of them were John the Baptist's followers. Remember that Philip, remember that some of John's disciples are now with Christ, and uh, probably the writer himself. Probably the writer himself, uh, the, because he was never, he never mentioned who was the other guy who followed Jesus. Now, probably they were baptizing in the same way, probably, calling people to repent of their sins. Next thing we see here is, is John discussing about God's plan. So I'd like to call this section, God is Sovereign. And let's read verses 25 to 28. Now, a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness 
that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. Let's review that. A discussion on purification. What is purification? It's ritual washing, Jewish customs on ritual washing, how to wash the hands. And then there was a discussion about that, probably a friendly discussion or probably a heated discussion. I remember one time, long ago, the usual instrument in a church was the organ. Some of you lived long enough to see that time. It was just the organ or just the piano. Then introduced were the drums, the electric guitar, the bass guitar, and so other things. I remember once upon a time that churches had a heated discussion. Is it proper or not? You have to understand that during that time, they think the organ is holier than the electric guitar. Because the electric guitar was usually used by rock bands, heavy metal bands who, who tried to create a following by saying that they're satanic. Although a lot of them were probably just using it as a marketing strategy. Or probably true that they were satanic. Now, they identified the electric guitar with these demonic rock bands. And uh, some church members said, we shouldn't have that here. Uh, some of them said, uh, why? Because we'll be falling away. Now, that wasn't the only discussion, the only thing that caused debate. When the computer was introduced, when I was a teenager, I heard a lot of ridiculous things. That's saying that is the beginning of 666. And I couldn't really see that. So when you observe them long enough, of course, I had to enter that debate and said, no, because it just sounded silly for me. But you wait long enough, you see them using computers already. And I'd love to say, I thought you said. That's why, ladies and gentlemen, this, these things sound ridiculous. But you may have beliefs today that are not biblical. That's why I say study it in context, but more of traditional of what should be and not be. Now, there was a discussion on purification. There was a, probably a, just a discussion or a heated discussion, but that's not the point of the author. The point was there was a discussion, but the main idea comes next. Verse 26, and what? The discussion shifted from discussion. The focus was shifted. Some of John's disciples called John's attention to the growing followers of the Lord, and some followers are like that. They seem to be more concerned of the popularity of their leader than the leader himself. He said, um, teacher, the one you baptized, you bear, bore witness to, he has more followers now. Um, probably this person thinks John is jealous because sometimes we judge people based on our background, but that should, one of the trainings in listening to people, in analyzing lives and even our own, is don't think that people are like you. They don't think and feel like you. And that's why we encourage you to study and study more, lest... You analyze the world in your own lens. There are many lenses, and that's very important to study Scripture because we must have the lens of Scripture. Now, if your lens is blue, the world is blue. If your lens is yellow, the world is yellow. If your lens is, don't trust anyone, then you don't trust anyone. That's your lens. All rich people are evil, then you don't want to earn more because you might become evil. 
you interpret 1 Timothy, Timothy 6 as money is the root of all evil. Actually, if you look at the Greek, it's really the love of money. The root word in the Greek is phileo. It's not money. It's the love of money. So sometimes we end up with these lenses. So probably these followers have the lens of, I have a rabbi, John the Baptist, and uh, my goal is to spread his teachings. But then, hey, that guy who, who John spoke of has more followers, and he was kind of concerned that probably their following would be diminished. But John did not think that way. Now, what did John reply? He cited God's sovereign will. No, those are, that's not the phrase here, but allow me to explain it through the text. Uh, going back to, to verse 27, John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. So what is John saying? He's saying that those who are following Christ were given by God himself. That's the text. And you will see here later on in, in, in the different chapters of John that those who follow Christ and his disciples were the Father's gift to him except for one. Now, if you are a follower of Christ, the text would also say that it was God's will that we follow Christ. A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. Can we expand the application? Uh, yes, of course. And this is so aligned even if you look at all the other scriptures, especially in Proverbs, that we have to acknowledge God in all things. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. In all our ways, we acknowledge that it is a gift from God. Then verse 28, to yourselves bear me witness that I said. Now, John is like saying, you still don't get it, do you? This was meant to happen. This was meant to happen. In fact, maybe, maybe John, at the back of John's mind, in fact, I'm really wondering why you're still here with me. You should be there. Probably at the back of his mind. I'm not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. John exclaimed that a person could not receive anything unless it was given from heaven. In other words, John acknowledged God's sovereignty in the matter of Christ having more followers than him. So it should be, since John's purpose was to reveal Christ. So I'd like to say, he is fulfilling his earthly ministry. Because there are more followers of Christ than followers of him. And Paul would be having the same position, and the other apostles would have the same position position, except that it's the risen Christ, the invisible Christ through the Holy Spirit that they speak about, that they should have faith in Him and not in them. One time when Paul and Barnabas went in a certain city, and a miracle was performed, and the people started worshiping them, and they ran away. They ran away. Because they know it's not about us. You're missing the message. It's not about me. It's about him. And John is saying that. It's not about me. It's about him. And Paul even said in his own life, I am crucified with Christ. Therefore, I no longer live. It is he who lives in me. I, and the life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me. It is no longer I but him. Now, John knew his place and purpose. He knew his place. He was the voice to prepare the way of the Lord. And when the person of John bore witness
And they said that he has more followers. When John's disciples or followers said they have more followers there, there are more people there. Now, what did John, how did John respond? Well, as if he's saying, my joy is complete. Oh, oh wonderful. Therefore, the Lord must increase and everyone else should decrease. That's the third point. He must increase. I must decrease. Verse 29. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. Decrease. Now, John identified, the Baptist identified himself as the friend of the bridegroom. The friend shares the joy of the bridegroom. Now, I think we call this probably as the best man, the friend of the bridegroom. He is happy for the groom. And uh, in our tradition and in many places around the world, there is the maid of honor. And uh, what is their role in our tradition? It is to support, to stand by one. It's just to stand by them as one of the witnesses. But not only stand by them, but be of help during the ceremony. Be of help. And they should rejoice. But there's one rule, and if ever somebody invites you to be the best man or the maid of honor, there's one rule you should never forget. Never outshine the couple. So sometimes I ask, what are you wearing? No, I really ask the groom sometimes, because I might, he might be wearing something dressed down, and I might dress up. I can't do that. I'm not the center of attention. And that's why the bride must be all dressed up and, and the maid of honor or we, and the rest have a uniform. What's the uniform? To make them look nice but never to outshine the bride. Now John the Baptist knew his place to never outshine the bridegroom. He knew his place. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. And verse 30, he must increase, but I must decrease. John knew his place as the friend of the bridegroom. In this case, he's not literally the friend. He was the witness. He was just using this as, a, as an example it's like this. It's like this, student. I hope you understand. I came to bear witness. I'm not the center of attention. He is. And our hope in our ministry and in our family, we show our family Christ. The focus is Him, not us. The focus is the Word of God. And not us. Of course, we must live in such a way that inspires them to follow Christ. He must increase in our lives and we must decrease. Application, exalt Christ and humble the self. John the Baptist said that Christ must increase and he must decrease. In our lives and in all that we do, Christ must increase. And we must decrease. What does that mean in all that we do? Literally in all. In our work, we pray that Christ would increase and we must decrease. We do it for Him. For His glory. In our studies, we want to glorify Him. In our fellowship with one another, in our relationships in the family, He must increase and we must decrease. We must ensure the self is not the head of the self because Christ is the head, not us. 
So we reflect in our lives, uh, is Christ increasing in my life? Am I decreasing? Uh, but if you find yourselves in Scripture not following the ways of the Lord, uh, then by God's grace, let us change our ways by His grace. He said to us, forgive, then we have to learn to forgive, even though how difficult it was. No reasons, no explanations. It's just the command. The command is to serve one another, no excuses. We find ways where we can serve one another. Well, each one's service may be unique compared to the others because we have different skills and talents and gifts. Yet the heart that says it is him, not me, must be forever in our consciousness. Therefore, we must humble ourselves before the Lord Jesus Christ, acknowledging our need for Him and of Him. And we must also continue to grow in Christ, which means submitting our will to His Word. Next, believe that God is sovereign. A man can receive nothing unless the Father gives it to him. We believe that God is sovereign and we believe that God will cause people to follow Christ. As John taught his disciples, we will teach people about the sovereign grace of God. That if you believe in Him and you repented of your sins, and if ever you sin, you feel disturbed, that is good. That is a gift from the Spirit. Because if you do not believe, you don't care whether you do sin or not. It doesn't matter. In fact, you justify it. Well, for me, it's not sin. If it's for you, it's sin. Well, everybody can have their own opinion. Uh, you're true to a certain degree, but if you trust in Christ and trust in His Word, you believe that He is God and He is Son of God and He is authoritative. Your belief cannot be selective. I believe in this part. I don't believe in this part. Well, if you're selective, then you don't believe. It's simple as that. That's why we study Scripture line by line, text by text, chapter by chapter, and in, a, in context. Not like how the devil used it when he tempted Christ, just choosing verses and explaining it. Doesn't mean somebody quotes verses, it's, it's what the author meant. That's why we have to study it line by line. Is this what the author is really saying? Does it make sense? Many of you are very intelligent people, and as we read these verses, as we mention to you the historical context and the literary context, you should say, yeah, that makes sense. But if suddenly I segue to something so far, huh, that's not what the text is saying. Like the Bereans, we must be critics of all who teach God's Word, including me. We believe that God is sovereign in terms of when people follow Him, a man can receive nothing. Christ, at that time, had more followers, and unless it is the Father's will, he could not have that. This is the Father's will. Now, now you, you mean that what if an evil man is enriched? Oh, yeah. Why? You have to understand that wealth is a snare as well as a blessing. It's a two-sided coin. That the wicked may have more wealth, but only to give him more judgment in the future. Sometimes at the far distance, we, on an, in, with earthly lens, we admire the rich and the famous, and even the rich and the famous and their criminals will do anything to get wealthy. Sometimes at the far, we are enamored, but we have to understand everything has a give and take. Everything has a responsibility. Some at first want to be famous, then when they're so famous, they wish they had a normal life. But what's the point? People are never satisfied. So what should we do? Thank God for what we have today. And if He gives us more, praise God. Should we work hard? Yes, that's the Bible said. But it is His will. If He gives us less, praise God. If He gives us when He gives us more, let's be responsible. Praise God. But if you say, I wish, if only I have that, I'll be happy. 
No, some people say, if only I earn 200,000 a month, I'll be happy. And through time, he reached 200,000 a month. Then he changed. If I only have 500,000 a month, I'll be happy. Then after a while, it changed. If I only have a million a month, I'll be happy. Then it keeps changing because people are not satisfied. Because outside Christ, there is this vacuum within. And right now, even a movement is trying to create some consciousness that being minimalist is better. And I know that that's better, but nothing satisfies the heart. Just like those who jump from one partner to another, one of these days I'll be happy. But right now, I'm in number eight. No, you won't, because you, you are probably the problem. Or part of the problem. A man can receive nothing unless... How do we respond to that? It's thank you, Lord. How about the problems? Uh, yes. Consider it all joy in the book of James, in the New Testament. Consider it all joy when you encounter various trials. If you have trials, consider it joy. It doesn't mean be a fake and jump for joy as if you were expecting the problem. Yeah, hey, I have a problem. No. It's counted joy. Count it as okay. You label it as there's a purpose for this. And I will have the joy of the Lord no matter how problematic I become. A man can receive nothing. A person can receive nothing unless it is given to you from above. Now, your wife or husband, if you are married, remember the verse, a person can receive nothing. That is God's gift to you. Whether that gift gives you joy or gives you a trial, well, it's kind of both, right? But hopefully, you'll have more joy if you follow God's word. Because it is possible. However, it can be a trial. Uh, where did it come from? A man, a person can receive nothing. You've got a wonderful job. Praise God. You don't have a wonderful job. Praise God. You've got a wonderful job. Keep getting better at it without neglecting the other responsibilities of family and mission. If you don't have a good job, then work on yourself instead of blaming others for your failure. Work, develop the self, study more, learn new skills, find more opportunities, overcome your, 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 your shyness, your timidity. But then what should be in the heart? Thank the Lord, you are sovereign. A person can receive nothing. We are where we are because of God's will. John the Baptist, according to the other writers, wore the skin of camels and ate locusts and honey. At one point, I thought John the Baptist was Ilocano. He was eating insects. He was, it seemed that he was who he is. I think he was confident with who he is because he knows that it was God's will. And that confidence comes from God. So if somebody says to me that everybody should prosper, I said, you have to define what that is. Because there's a King David who seemed to have everything. And the John the Baptist, he seemed to have very little. Both are servants of God. So, why should we envy others? First, we are where we are and say, thank you, Lord. I will work on this. And whatever we receive, you say, I could not have received this without him. But that doesn't mean you stop being responsible. The more we should be responsible. Contentment, I see, is better with the perspective of the lens of Scripture rather than trying to be content. <gasps> you feel envious. Bakit shalang? Sana all. It cannot be all. 
It cannot be all. Because we're interested with different things. We're willing to sacrifice for different things. We pursue with different reasons. So it cannot be all. And that's the point. God made each and every one of us as we are, unique. And I stand here in front of you. I cannot see two phases exactly the same. But even if you are twins and you seem to look exactly the same, your habits and mannerisms are not always the same. Your desires are not always the same. But one desire we must have is Jesus Christ himself the Word of God, to submit to His sovereign Lordship, trust in the Word, and then be content where we are. That's why envy is not good, because sometimes we're just not students of life. We have to be students of life. It's good to listen, because not everybody thinks like me. It's good to listen. Uh, how they reach a certain level of contentment or level of success is different from each one. It's good to listen. And it's good to learn. And it's good for me not to give them an assessment that is not is based on my opinion. It should be based on what? Scripture first. That's the safest way. Uh, according to Scripture. Not according to me. According to Scripture. That's why when somebody tells me, brother, I feel like I'm a good for nothing. Okay, hey, what else? And they have a long list of negativity. Uh, is there more? Do you have a list? Why don't you write it down? I mean, I really want to exhaust it because it keeps replaying in the mind. At least if it's written down, you don't have to replay, right? And you can post somewhere how terrible I am. Because part of that is truth. Ah, what's the truth there? Romans 1. God gave up the world to a depraved mind. We are sinners. Then once you realize that, then you see the need for Christ and the power of the Spirit to transform you. And now your confidence is not on yourself, but is in Christ. That's a big difference. So if ever you want to say anything negative to me, I might probably agree with you, 90%. Yeah, 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 that one too. But by His grace, we are given the power every day to be sanctified, to be transformed. The way we think, the way we speak, the way we behave is being changed by Him, not because we're some holier than thou or better than everybody else, and that's the problem when the testimony becomes about the self. You should become a believer too because look at me. Ah, ah, you're crossing the line there, fellow. Don't cross that line. It's never about you. Because you're human and you might fail. And all your pride in saying, look at me, how he changed me. Yeah, it should be. Look at the Word of God, how He transforms. I'm one testimony. I'm still not perfect, but I have seen many changes by God's grace. Because once you start elevating yourself, so what's the response of the unbelieving world? Well, is that a Christian? Christian Bayan? I've heard that so many times. So the answer is yes. Imperfect people, saved by grace alone. And if ever we are wrong, we have to seek His forgiveness. And if ever we offend you, we seek your forgiveness. But we do not at all apologize for Him. The truth is the truth. And we must proclaim the truth. God is sovereign. So, um, whatever you're thinking of complaining about, you say, Lord, teach me not to complain about this. There's a purpose for this. You have a boss that sounds unreasonable. There is a purpose for that. To teach you patience, right? Oh, right? You have a brother or a sister that seems to be always having a little friction. 
It's to teach you how to love one another. It's teaching you not to be selfish. What do we do? Thank you, Lord. Can you say with me? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now imagine what you're going through, the worst thing right now. You just say, thank you, Lord. Again, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There's a purpose. All you have to do is remember Scripture. You remember the life of Joseph. Going through difficult times, difficulty after difficulty after difficulty. In every difficulty, he learned something. And he learned something. And he learned something until he was qualified to be the governor of Egypt. Now, I'm not saying just because you're having a difficulty, you'll be governor one day. <laughs> That's the wrong way of interpreting it. I'm just saying God has a purpose for everything. Why are you always offended? That's your complaint. Always, always a complaint with everybody. I think the Lord's teaching you not to be offended, no matter what. You can smile. Okay. Maybe that's true, then maybe I should change. But if it's not true, God sees my heart. And Lord, forgive me if I have failed you, but I'd like to follow you. I don't want to be affected. Why? Because if you're affected, if John the Baptist was affected, John, but mas malaki church niya kesa sa you. If he was affected, why he has bigger, more followers than you? If he was jealous and insecure, he would. But some of you like doing that. How, why is your brother has higher grades than you? Why is she a better dancer than you? Ah. Sometimes you're that. Hey, you hear me? Because I hear you. I'm your pastor here. I listen to you and I hear you. I've been waiting for this sermon. <laughs> <laughs> Try not to think that way. Change the way you think. Repentance is a change of mindset, a change of mind. Each person is unique. Somebody great at dancing might not be so good with math. Somebody who might be so good at sports don't understand sports science. Is that possible? Yes, it's possible. Lastly, continue to witness, John the Baptist testified that Jesus was the Lamb of God. He fulfilled his primary purpose as the forerunner. Yet John continued to witness by continuing to baptize other, others. We must proclaim the witness of the apostles continuously. There's no retirement. You don't say, I've been serving the Lord all my life, sharing the gospel, making disciples. I'm done. There's no such thing. If you're done, well, and if you're right, you're done and you're right, wait for the call of the Lord. One day you'll wake up seeing angels and saying, it's time, huh? It's time. No, 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 not yet, not yet. You know, I, I just had a baby. I can't go. Not yet. No, no, no. I, my, my, I just had my third grandson. So, no, no, I know. Of the, one of the main purpose of God for every believer is to proclaim the gospel, make disciples. That's part of it. How? Little by little. We learn, we share. Well, you can try, but if you don't know how, share this video online. Just share it. Who knows? One person might hear it and one person from your circle might the Lord might speak to that person in his heart through the word of God. Maybe you find ways. It is not, it is not the end. Yet we are content where we are. We follow scripture. Yet whatever God gives us, it is God's will. 
whatever the Lord does not give us yet or will never give us, that is God's will. Now, some will have a hard time with this, but that's the point of believing that a man can receive nothing unless it is given to him from above. Nothing should stop us to continue the witness. So I give you right now a piece of poetry with the title, He Must Increase. He must increase, I must decrease. Self-promotion in us must cease. A person can receive nothing unless it was the Lord's choosing. All of us who believe in him, he saved from the power of sin. Born of his spirit, not of man, it's the Father's amazing plan. According to John the Baptist, something that we all must practice, it's not about me, yes, it's not. We're not the center of the plot. My life is all about the Lord. Let us all put that on record. Let's set this in our hearts today. It's all about Him. That's the way. Let us all rise. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for your word. In our lives, we pray, may you increase and we must decrease. Similar to what Luke recorded that the Lord taught, whoever wants to follow, he must deny himself. In the same words or similar words, though not exactly the same, it means you must increase and we must decrease. We must set aside our desires, our wants, and submit it to you and follow every word of Scripture. Lord, our goals we submit to you. Bless it as you will or change it as you will. We will trust you. And allow us to learn through the process of crisis and blessing, of achievement and failure. Whatever we go through, teach us to acknowledge your work and plan. And behind every trial, you are there. It's still you teaching us, supporting us, strengthening us. And sometimes we fail. No, many times we do. Then you repeat the process until we learn. Until we learn that it's about you alone. Lord, in our families, in our marriage, in our relationship with everyone, may you increase and we decrease. In our church community, may you increase and we decrease. In everything we do in our work, in our business, in our academics, our studies, may you increase and we decrease. In everything we pray, be glorified. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of His Spirit be with you all. And God's people say, Amen. Amen. Good morning. God bless you.